we'll begin, um, and I don't want to uh, delay too long because uh, it turns out I have way more material than I expected I would when I started preparing for this. So let's just uh, dive right in, uh, and may go a little bit long, but I, there's lunch afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Rose Hill Presbyterian Church, The Untold History. Uh, the 18th century German church leader, Count Nikolaus Zinzendorf, uh, he once famously said, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. <laughs> and uh, in studying the history of this, our congregation for the centennial celebration, uh, I think my predecessors here at Rose Hill, uh, my predecessors in the pulpit, they really took those words to heart. They preach the gospel uh, to this church, to this neighborhood, and then they died, and then they were pretty much forgotten by history. It is very hard to find information on the first several generations of Rose Hill's pastors. Uh, they left behind almost no published writings, theological books. Uh, they didn't leave behind lots and lots of written sermons. They were not known as major theologians in their day. Nobody wrote biographies about them um, the way that uh, people did for other major uh, Southern Presbyterian theologians. We heard about Benjamin Morgan Palmer earlier. He's got a biography, um, James Henley Thornwell, and so on. Uh, you can find lots of material on those guys, but uh, the pastors of Rose Hill, not so much. Uh, in fact, I have to say, these, these gospel preaching men, they were so forgotten after they died that even our own church has had trouble getting their names right. Uh, I'm going to name only two examples, but I have more. So a church history prepared by our own congregation for, in 1994 for our 75th anniversary celebration, it incorrectly lists the uh, church planter's name as W.F. Daniels. His first initial should have been M because his name was Milton. Uh, earlier than that, uh, in the 50th anniversary bulletin for our church, he's listed as M.L. Daniels. Milton F. Daniels was his name. <laughs> How bad is that when your own church can't get your name right, the church that you planted? That's how forgotten he was. So I initially titled this talk, The Untold History of Rose Hill Presbyterian Church. I was trying to be humorous and hopefully get people interested, thinking, oh, maybe there's something you know, scandalous about it uh, that you know, I want to hear about, something sensationalistic. But it turned out that that title was much truer than I realized. Uh, the history's untold because nobody's told it, and there's not much that we know to tell. Um, those early pastors, they were happy to just preach the gospel and die and be forgotten, and yet uh, through their labors, the Lord uh, established and built up a church that's here a hundred years later, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, some parts of Rose Hill's story have been told before, uh, and so if you, re you can read earlier versions of our church history, documents that have been prepared, and if you read those, you can learn about, uh, for example, some of the, the important families that were involved in the planting and in the first generations of our congregation families, individuals who made just huge con contributions to the work at Rose Hill. Uh, or you can learn a lot about the, uh, the architectural history of our facility, different schoolrooms and different buildings that were built and then torn down and other ones replaced them and then those got torn down and so on and so forth. A uh, little plug here uh, during the Sunday school hour tomorrow, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the architecture of Rose Hill, really just focusing on the sanctuary, but uh, not talking so much about education buildings and wings that have, have uh, come along uh, in the meantime. Um, but uh, uh, people walk into the sanctuary and they're, they're always struck by how beautiful it is, because it is beautiful, and so that's what I'll be focusing on. Um, and a lot of the windows and that sort of thing. 
Today, though, I really want to focus mostly on the history of the ministry at Rose Hill Presbyterian Church, and mostly focusing on some interesting things I found out about her early ministers, um, and uh, really focusing on the first several generations of pastors. I'm not going to talk about the more recent ones so much, just very briefly, a uh, little bit because uh, Pastor Wilkes referred to uh, some of the you know, more recent history, the Great Secession in, in 1983, um, and also because, well, you guys know the more recent people, <laughs> uh, we know them better, um, it's those early ones who've been forgotten, so that's really what I'm focusing on. So uh, let's dive in. Um, sorry, the light's a little bit, uh, it's not great in here, but hopefully you can see the screen. Um, so the roots of Rose Hill Presbyterian Church, they lie in a Sunday school class that was started in 1913 that was targeting the Olympia, Granby uh, Mill areas, and it was an initiative of the Christian Endeavor Society of First Presbyterian Church. The Christian Endeavor Society was their uh, very long name for basically their youth group. Um, I guess it sounds more impressive if you than youth group to call it a Christian Endeavor Society. Um, so they started a Sunday school class in the Mill uh, Village, and it was originally known as the Rose Hill Mission. And it was heavily supported by First Presbyterian Church, and many of the charter members of what became the congregation of Rose Hill would come from the, we'll call it the Mother Church. Uh, the mission, it was initially led by Mr. Frank Outlaw, uh, with help of others, and in particular, there were two sisters, Miss Gwen and Miss Emily Dick. Now, typically, the class was taught by Gwen, uh, but one Sunday, she was not feeling well, and so she asked uh, Emily, her older sister, to fill in, and her sister said, well, I'll, I'll go this time, but don't expect me to keep filling in for you. <laughs> nice, you know, sisterly sentiment there. Um, uh, so Emily did it. She uh, went and taught. That experience was really cr crucial for her. She was so moved by what she saw and kind of the condition of these, these mill children. Uh, her heart just went out to them, and she became very zealous for ministry to them. And eventually, Gwen's kind of zeal, passion for outreach ministry to uh, these kids Eventually, it leads to the founding of Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University, uh, as a place for training local Christian workers. So, uh, basically what that means is, in the Lord's providence, the initiative that led to the planting of Rose Hill Presbyterian Church also uh, led to the founding of Columbia International University. Uh, the Lord was doing a lot with this one Sunday school class. Um, I don't have a great uh, picture here, but I do have a little uh, ancient map for you. So the mission originally met in the Rose Hill Schoolhouse, and so there's the location. Uh, for some years, it moved over to Olympia Village. It eventually moved back to the Rose Hill neighborhood, um, and uh, that's where they were teaching this Sunday school class. It, it flourished very quickly. Uh, and attendance was good, participation was enthusiastic, and uh, according to, I believe this was a note in the newspaper, uh, Rose Hill Mission, it was called a house of happiness. Well, um, it wasn't just uh, Olympia, Granby, uh, uh, Mill area. There were other mill-targeted works around uh, the city, and so the local presbytery, the kind of the regional gathering of churches, which is known as the Congaree Presbytery, uh, they began to get involved, and a student from Columbia Seminary, Milton F. Daniels, <laughs> we got it right, um, he came in to foster the work, and I have to say, I think this is the only picture of him known to mankind. I, I had to work hard to track this down with the help of uh, archivists at Moody Bible Institute. So this is his graduation picture from Moody Bible Institute in 1917. Uh, Daniels, he'd been born in Savannah, 1894. He had worked as a railroad train man and then was converted 
and uh, became just a very zealous Christian, uh, and quickly felt a call into ministry. So he went to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, 1915, graduated 1917. So that's his graduation picture. And then he enrolled uh, as a student in Columbia Theological Seminary. I have a little bit more to say about that, although we did, uh, well, let me say it right now. In fact, here's a picture of old Columbia Seminary. Uh, it was located downtown in what is known as the Robert Mills Mansion um, on Blanding Street. Uh, it was moved later to Decatur, Georgia, but it kept the name Columbia just to keep you confused. <laughs> Columbia Seminary, not in Columbia. Uh, I mean, I was, I was a student at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis when it finally dawned on me that it's not there in Columbia? What? So, I'm from Washington State, so we don't necessarily track those kinds of details up there. Um, Columbia Seminary was an incredibly important school for Southern Presbyterianism uh, in general and for Presbyterians in Columbia and the region in particular. Uh, we will see uh, that Rose Hill's history is indebted in many ways to uh, Columbia Seminary's ministry. I will put in this plug, I cannot recommend this highly enough, the history of Old Columbia Seminary was written by uh, David Calhoun, Dr. K David Calhoun, who's actually spoken here before, I've seen pictures of him at events, um, but he was one of my seminary professors at Covenant Seminary, he's Emeritus Professor of Church History, a native of Sumter, uh, so I mean he's from the area, uh, he wrote a history of First Presbyterian Church, big big history of it. Also wrote a big history of Columbia Seminary. Wonderful read, so highly recommend it. Um, so uh, there we have a picture of it, and uh, Columbia Seminary and Rose Hill, uh, there's a, a lot of linkages there. We'll, I'll try to point those out. Um, all right, going back to old Milton. Uh, Congaree Presbytery had an eye on this work that Daniels was doing. So he kind of came in and was leading this Sunday school class, developing it. And uh, uh, Congaree Presbytery was also getting involved in keeping an eye on it, uh, encouraging it, supporting it. And so we find this, this was written in the minutes of the Presbytery. They said this, uh, Rose Hill, under the leadership of Mr. M.F. Daniels, is located in a mill village which the light is transforming. All things considered, Rose Hill has made perhaps the best evangelistic and financial record in our presbytery this year, largely because Brother Daniels and others associated with him believe in evangelism and the tithe. <laughs> the tithe. Uh, so, uh, strong emphasis on evangelism, but also a strong emphasis on give 10% to the Lord. Uh, that's kind of the biblical standard, and if you are part of this church, that's what you do. And, uh, well, I guess they, they emphasized both those aspects, and uh, uh, evangelism was an important part of Rose Hill's founding. Um, and uh, afterwards, I, as I go through the session records and so on, find all of these references to evangelistic campaigns and revival campaigns that the church pursued over the years, um, with bringing in different speakers and just different initiatives in the neighborhood getting out and spreading the word. Um, so the light was transforming the neighborhood and the work was finding success and uh, the old paper, the Columbia Record, has a little note on uh, its progress. They said this, it is already a flourishing institution. Mr. Daniels is doing a fine work and is liked by the members, members of his congregations. Daniels, uh, uh, he had great gifts for ministry. That becomes clear. The Presbytery Committee that examined him uh, and recommended him for licensure, so licensing him to preach, uh, they said this. They had examined the written thesis of Brother Daniels on faith and work with a great, eel, great deal of interest and delight. The paper shows that he has an accurate understanding of the subject and that he handles the word with accuracy and appropriateness. Now, I am the chairman of our Presbytery's Examination Committee, and I can tell you that it's not 
that common that a candidate comes through and we say, we examined him with great interest and delight. <laughs> we examine them and we try to help them and get them prepared, but there's not that many that come through that it's, wow, we just loved listening to that guy. Usually they need some work still. So Daniel's, uh, he, he had a lot of gifts right out of the starting gate. And uh, later that same year of his licensure, Presbytery reported this. The work of Rose Hill under Mr. M.F. Daniels, a licentiate of the Presbytery, has made more than satisfactory progress. There will be presented from that place a petition to Presbytery at this time for an organization, forming it as a church, in other words. And your committee hopes that the Presbytery will see its way clear to grant the petition and appoint a commission to act at once. Presbytery learns with pleasure of the generous offer of Mr. W.D. Melton to donate a suitable place of worship. Um, so this gets, I'll say a little bit about this tomorrow. Uh, well, I'll just repeat myself. Um, this Melton, uh, he later became the president of the University of South Carolina. He lived in, in Columbia, uh, did a lot with real estate and business. Uh, and uh, uh, the Presbytery minutes say that he donated the land. Technically, he sold the lot for five dollars. So uh, you know, even adjusting for inflation, that's still dirt cheap um, for a piece of property like uh, we have. Uh, five dollars, you know, even back in 1919, uh, that's pretty good. Um, the group did petition the Presbytery uh, to be organized as a congregation. And so there was an organizing service uh, that took place at the Rose Hill School at 7.30 p.m. October 31st, 1919. So that's Reformation Sunday, and that's kind of our, the official birthday of the congregation. So at that meeting, they took in 30 charter members. Uh, the service, uh, they also elected two elders and one deacon. They elected them, ordained them, installed them. And also, the congregation voted unanimously to change their name from the Rose Hill Mission to Rose Hill Presbyterian Church. And they then also passed a resolution to express thanks to First Presbyterian Church uh, for their interest, their help in promoting the Rose Hill Mission. Now, uh, uh, Daniels, he was not actually elected as the first pastor of the church. He's what we would call a church planter, so he got the thing started up and running, but he was not voted on by the congregation as their pastor, and that's in Presbyterian church structure, the congregation has to make that vote. Um, actually, by January 1920, uh, so just a few months after the organization service, he had been called to a pastorate in Georgia, and so he was very soon gone, so planted, but quickly then moved on to Georgia. Uh, to a different uh, church as pastor. Um, and you might think, well, wow, that seems kind of quick. Uh, shouldn't he have stayed around a while longer? Uh, it turns out, uh, this, this is one of those little oddball facts you uh, come across. Daniels was not the only person. He was not even the first person to leave Rose Hill quickly. Uh, in the session minutes of uh, November 4th, 1919, so this is less than a week after the organizing service. October 31st, you know, they organize, they take in these 30 charter members. Less than a week later, the session meets, and there's a note that they removed one of the charter members from the membership role, quote, for having renounced the communion of the church by joining another denomination. So, I mean, that was really fast. <laughs> There's always been church shoppers. That's kind of a lesson. Um, anyway, uh, Daniels, he was invited uh, back to preach at the sanctuary dedication just a couple of years later. Um, so, you know, he had a good relationship with the church, uh, and he came back uh, for that uh, occasion. He had a couple of short pastorates in Georgia, and then he became an evangelist in the Charlotte area. Uh, he was the superintendent for home missions for that presbytery, and that allowed him to focus on church planting efforts and evangelism, uh, because that's really what his heart for ministry was. Uh, one of his colleagues remarked that uh, the members of this committee feel that, he's, that Daniels is now entering upon his life's cherished work and the work that he is especially called to do 
and where his remarkable gifts can be used to the best advantage. Uh, The pastor of First Church in Charlotte, a man named Dr. Johnson, he said, Mr. Daniels has peculiar gifts for this field of labor, evangelism. Uh, Coupled with evangelistic fervor, God has endowed him with a splendid teaching ability and a pleasing personality. And uh, he felt, uh, Daniels felt that he all along, that this would be his, the largest opportunity for service would be in the field of evangelism. Sounds very good. Uh, Tragically, on the night of March 13th, 1924, uh, after leading an evangelistic service in Greenville, South Carolina, he was struck in a hit-and-run accident as he was crossing a street, and he died uh, not long after that from his injuries. Uh, and I'm not going to give you the whole narrative, but actually there were two vehicles involved, uh, both uh, hit and then ran. They were, the drivers were later caught and charged and so on. Um, but it was one, th- one month shy of his 30th birthday, uh, so, very young man, left a wife and three children. So, uh, just think about that. I mean, all told, I mean, his public ministry wasn't even 10 years long. Um, so, a very short uh, race for him. Uh, the presbytery that he was in published a memorial that's it's kind of a, a remembrance of his life, and it said a number of things. Uh, that he should be taken away just in the beginning of what promised to be a most fruitful ministry is a great mystery, but we cannot question an all-wise providence and know that all things work together for good that them that love him to them who are called according to his purpose. Mr. Daniel's faith in the power of prayer, his love for God's word, his powerful presentation of Jesus Christ as the only hope of salvation, and his devotion to his service were marked features of his ministry, while his genial disposition made him a most agreeable associate. Surely a man of great promise has been called from a fruitful work here into the presence of the master whom he loved and faithfully served. So let's just think about this. Uh, As a congregation, we should be grateful that the Lord saw fit to use part of a very brief ministry for this crucial phase in uh, bringing Rose Hill to fruition. Uh, If it hadn't been for Milton Daniels, we wouldn't be here. Uh, humanly speaking, and so the Lord chose to use, you know, a couple years of a very brief ministry on us. Well, the first man who was actually elected as uh, uh, the congregation's pastor was Edward Stephen Campbell. Uh, I wish you could see the picture a little bit better. Boy, these guys were good looking. I mean, (laughs) things have really gone downhill around here. Um, Rose Hill was his first Call to a church. Campbell was the son of a minister, Reverend John C. Campbell, who was from Glasgow, Scotland, but he was the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Biloxi, Mississippi. Don't know how a Glaswegian wound up in Biloxi, but um, I'll maybe find that out someday. Uh, Edward, the son, was born in 1897 in Oberlin, Kansas. Uh, studied at Maryville College. He then studied at Columbia Seminary. Before he came to Rose Hill, he had been ordained by a presbytery in Mississippi to serve as a chaplain in World War I, and uh, that's how he served from 1917 to 1919. And during that time, he received, a, he received a British military medal for bravery on the battlefield, and he was decorated by Sir Douglas Haig, one of the senior British military commanders of World War I. I'm dying to learn more about that. (laughs) I've got my staff working on it. Uh, Well, mostly Rose Thomas. Is Rose here this morning? (laughs) Uh, Rose works at the Caroliniana Library, so hopefully she can uh, help me track down. Uh, This guy fascinates me. Uh, Campbell was called to Rose Hill uh, in June of 1920, and he was officially installed by the Presbytery on November 5th, 1920. He resigned from Rose Hill uh, two years later, November 19th, 1922. So a short pastorate, just just over two years long, and that was fairly typical for Rose Hill in those early days, short pastorates. I'll say a little bit more about that um, uh, in a minute. But it was a very productive uh, time in the church's life. 
uh, because it was during those two years of ministry that this sanctuary was built. Uh, it was completed in 1921, and in case I haven't plugged my uh, sanctuary tour tomorrow enough yet, I'll plug it one more time. Uh, so 1921, in the middle of uh, Campbell's ministry here, was when the sanctuary was uh, dedicated. And Campbell himself went on to have a, a long and a fruitful ministry. He served some short pastorates uh, until he was called to Lookout Mountain Presbyterian Church in Lookout Mountain. <laughs> Uh, in 1929, uh, Lookout Mountain Presbyterian Church, for those of you who don't know, it's one of, it became one of the very large and very influential churches in our denomination. And during his time at that congregation, they went through a building program and built this gorgeous, I mean, gorgeous church building that everybody oohs and ahs over. So go look it up online. You'll ooh and ah too. Um, uh, you would think, okay, you, you just hit the big time there, uh, you know, you just finish out your ministry. No, not for him. The story doesn't end there. September 14, 1942, he resigned from that church, uh, not because he was dissatisfied or things were going poorly. Uh, he said, only because he felt that his place was with the armed forces of our country, and so he re-enlisted in the army chaplaincy to serve in World War II. Uh, entered as a first lieutenant, served until 1946, and attained the rank of major. And he spent uh, most of his time deployed uh, in North Africa, uh, Sicily, Italy, and he, he received several medals for meritorious service uh, there. So uh, Reverend Campbell was literally and spiritually a soldier for Christ. And uh, uh, he just, that's where his heart was. Uh, that amazes me. World War I, World War II. Um, and uh, you get a sense of kind of this soldier mentality from a sermon that he preached in 1938. This was during his Lookout Mountain uh, pastorate. Don't have any sermons from his time here at Rose Hill. Um, but the sermon was on 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. We are laborers together with God. And so he's preaching this in 1938, World War II. It, the prospect is looming, uh, but it still seems very relevant for today. He wrote this, said this. In generations gone by, the church has been marked by much controversy and division. Christian folk have often been inclined to separate over very trivial and unessential matters. The church of our own day has been marked by self-complacency and indifference. There have been many who have been inclined to, quote, sit at ease in Zion and who have treated religion as a minor in life rather than as something of major importance. Out of 1938, he's saying that. But the church of the future must be and will be a militant church, for nothing but the militant Christian faith in the church can stem the tide of militant godlessness in the world today. So in Reverend Campbell, uh, you find kind of a David and a Solomon combined. You have David, great warrior, but also Solomon who built the temple of God. Uh, literally, that, that was uh, Reverend Campbell, uh, a great soldier for the Lord, but also a builder of God's house. Little side note, Reverend Campbell actually returned here in 1969 to preach at the 50th anniversary service of this congregation. We talked about that some last evening for those of you who were there. Um, so he came back. He was the preacher that day. His sermon was on Romans 16, and the title was The Church Roll. Boy, would I love to get my hands on a copy of that sermon. If any of you have it in your files somewhere, hand it to me. So 1920 to 1922. Beg pardon? His wife did sing, yes, uh, uh, in, in the 50th service and in the dedication service as well. Um, the next uh, pastor was Benjamin Franklin Yandel, maybe because of the first two names. He often went by Frank <laughs> or uh, just uh, B. Yandel. Uh, um, he was the son of a Presbyterian ruling elder. He was the youngest of eight children. Uh, born January 22nd, 1893 in Sardis, North Carolina. Uh, Yandel had some uh, similarities to his predecessors, 
like Reverend Campbell, he had served in World War I. He was stationed in Fort Lee, Virginia. During World War II, he was designated a National Chaplain of War Dads uh, because he had a son in military service at that point. Uh, after his military service, he enrolled in Columbia Seminary like his predecessors. He graduated in 1923. Uh, Apparently, he sang. He was musical. He sang in a quartet. And uh, Rose Hill voted unanimously to call him February 5th, 1923, just a couple months after Reverend Campbell had resigned. Um, it was also his first congregation, uh, like Edward Campbell. Uh, he was ordained, installed on May 9th of uh, 23, and the ordination sermon was preached by a professor from Columbia Seminary, Henry Alexander White, on Acts 2, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You may not, Craig will know, and maybe a few others, Henry Alexander White, he's big time in Southern Presbyterian church lore. So it amazes me to think he preached from that pulpit there. Um, you can look him up sometime, uh, but he was, he was one of the stalwarts of old Columbia, um, uh, as you can see, uh, Pastor Yandel, he was like his predecessors. He didn't stay very long. Um, uh, he gave his resignation to the session just over a year uh, after his ordination, May 14th, 1924. He went on to serve churches in uh, Asheville and in Charlotte. Uh, he also taught Bible at Queens College passed away on January 16, 1967, to a heart ailment. Uh, looking at the records that I've been able to go through, you can see he regularly attended presbytery meetings, and he participated in them, so he was a good churchman. And at his passing, presbytery also had a memorial which said this, uh, with his background of early Christian training, his inherited love for Christ and the church, his biblical training and love for the fundamentals of the faith and his zeal in witnessing for Christ, Frank Yandel made a lasting imp impression upon people. His interest in his colleagues in the ministry drew them to him, and they loved him for it. As a pastor, he was sympathetic and understanding. As a preacher, his zeal was unflagging. Now, I want to just zoom out for a minute here, uh, and so let's, let's kind of get the, the bigger picture so from, its from Rose Hill's organization on October 31st, 1919 to uh, Pastor Yandel's resignation, May of 1924, Rose Hill had been served by three pastors, that's three ministers, in less than five years. That's a pretty high rate of turnover, and that's not ideal. Uh, and it does make you wonder... Uh, where there, whether there were problems of some kind going on in the congregation, financial, interpersonal, or otherwise. Uh, so, for example, uh, just a few weeks after the session received his resignation, there's a note in the session minutes that the elders, they were discussing among themselves the advisability of calling a pastor, and they, quote, decided not to call a pastor at this time, like a permanent pastor. Uh, so they were going to look for somebody who would be more temporary as an interim pastor. And less than a year after that, uh, uh, there was an, an interim pastor in place and things were stabilizing. And the presbytery minutes at that point state that the future at Rose Hill is much more hopeful than six months ago. That kind of suggests that things were maybe not as rosy as we might have hoped. Well, who was the man who you know, stepped up to fill in the gap? This fella, it's not a great, it, just the quality of the picture, it was hard to get a good one, but Harry Waddell Pratt, he was stated supply, 1924 to 1926. Pratt had been born in 1873, Lexington, Virginia. Uh, most of his schooling was at Washington and Lee University, and uh, he actually was an instructor of mathematics there for uh, a period of time. But he eventually went into ministry, and pastored Presbyterian churches in Petersburg, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., and looking for Gene Abbeville, South Carolina. He was pastor there, too. Um, when Rose Hill approached him 
in August of 1924, after Yandel had resigned. Uh, he was already living in Colombia, and he was mostly involved in kind of denominational work, um, administrative work, fundraising work for the Synod of South Carolina. Um, and he was also serving in some capacity teaching at Columbia Seminary. Later, he would become a faculty at Columbia Bible College. So, um, foreshadowing here. This won't be the last time that Rose Hill employs a seminary professor uh, as an interim. <laughs> um, but he was, he was local, uh, had a lot of experience, and uh, so he was filled in. Now, because Pratt was doing a lot of other stuff, he couldn't devote a lot of time here to the church, uh, or he had very limited time that he could devote. And so the presbytery was helping to provide oversight and support and so on. And uh, presbyteries have committees that do this sort of thing. And so the committee that was uh, kind of overseeing uh, the work at Rose Hill, that they were, they were you know, coming alongside uh, Dr. Pratt to just keep an eye on things and evaluate things. And one thing they were doing was to take a look at, well, what's what's Rose Hill's situation in this neighborhood? Because Rose Hill was actually a pretty young neighborhood uh, at the time. Things were not as built up as they are now. Um, and so uh, in 1926, this committee, uh, no, they had this kind of notation. They said, a careful canvas or survey of the community has revealed the fact that there are not a great many unchurched people in the neighborhood, and most of these have affiliations with other churches. There are about 25 Presbyterian families within a short walk of the church, which hold their membership in other Presbyterian churches. These Presbyterians are not in the least interested in the building up of Rose Hill Church. Um, well, Rose Hill's origins had been with more with the mill worker population, and they'd had great success evangelistically, but it seems that they were having more trouble kind of making an impact on this community uh, the immediate neighborhood because it was fairly church. There were all these Presbyterians, but they all were, you know, members elsewhere. And, you know, it's, it's not kosher to go and try to cheap steal. Um, so uh, that was a challenge uh, that they were facing. Uh, but despite all of that, things were moving, were, were going in an encouraging way. Um, that same Presbytery report that just said, that stuff about, you know, these Presbyterians who aren't interested in going there. They also said this, the Sunday night congregations are larger than the membership. When the weather is warm enough to use outdoors, the midweek attendance, like for a Wednesday night program, uh, it often goes over 300, and the Sunday night attendance over 200. These, of course, are people who live in the community, who want to attend church, but who find the church buildings where they ordinarily worship so uncomfortable in hot weather that they formerly went nowhere at night. So hot nights, they, Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, they would hold services outside, and all the people who it's like, it's too hot to go to my regular church, will go to the, you know, the neighborhood service at Rose Hill, and over 200 people in the evening service. Wow. Uh, so you learn from that note, uh, and I came across this in reading the session records and minutes and looking at church bulletins from the time, that Rose Hill actually had a robust Sunday evening worship service and a Wednesday night program. Um, actually, for the majority of Rose Hill's history, uh, we've had a Sunday evening service. Now, we just started a Sunday evening service a little over a year ago, um, I had no idea about all this history when we started that up. We just wanted to, add, we felt like it was good to add another preaching service and good for people to hear the word more than once on Sunday. And uh, it's gone well. The Lord's blessed that service. If I had known this, you know, a year ago and we were, you know, talking about it to the church, you can bet I would have uh, played that card too. Uh, it's, in a way, we're going back to our roots as a congregation. Um, so, uh, Interesting. Uh, skip that. Um, going on, moving on to the next uh, pastor, Pratt, he served until 1926, and then he was followed by Joseph Watts Conyers, 
born in 1896 in Manning, South Carolina. Uh, this was his first pastoral call, uh, and he remained at Rose Hill longer than anybody so far, so 1927 to 1934. And uh, Nita, uh, uh, I was talking to someone this morning who, uh, there's a connection with Conyers' son, who also went into ministry, so I'm going to try to track down uh, the son of this Conyers that I'm talking about. Um, uh, what can we say about uh, his time at Rose Hill? Well, there was financial stress, uh, and that was, kind of, that was a constant theme in the early years, and it would be a constant theme for a while still. Um, the Presbytery, if you look at the Presbytery minutes, it indicates that First Presbyterian Church was helping to underwrite the pastor's salary here uh, because finances were just tight. But uh, despite financial issues, uh, ministry was effective. Um, they were even sending young men into the ministry, and uh, there were some uh, people who went off uh, to seminary at this time. Uh, I came across this. There was a letter that he wrote to the congregation on the one-year anniversary of his, uh, his uh, uh, I can't remember if it was his ordination, installation, or just the one-year anniversary of receiving the call to the church. So that was neat, and I wanted to read kind of a long excerpt from it, but uh, here's, here's a guy kind of writing a letter to the congregation about a, you know, a year after. Um, oh, here's the answer. He wrote this. One year ago today, I was installed as your pastor. It has occurred to me that a brief report of the past year's work may lead us to discover some lessons of encouragement and inspiration for our future work. You will remember that at first, the work was far from encouraging. Sickness and trouble have entered into nearly every home of the congregation during the year. But despite these and other retarding influences which were encountered at the outset, we've experienced the blessing of Christ and have, quote, seen his work prospering under our hands. The most commendable and inspiring advance of our church has been along spiritual lines. It is generally agreed that there has been a wholesome growth in zeal for Christ, enthusiasm for His service, and loyalty to His church. After all, the great result we are seeking is the salvation of souls and the growth in grace of our members. Thinking upon these things, our hearts are filled with gratitude to the Master for such evidence of His favor. The glory and all the glory for the achievements of the past year must be accorded to him, for without his blessing, nothing could have been done that would have really counted. With the evidence, then, of his blessing, let us take new heart and resolve to demonstrate to our Savior that we are grateful for his blessings bestowed. Let us reconsecrate ourselves and our means to his service. Let us seek in prayer his approval. Let us seek in Bible study his will. Let us covet all spiritual graces and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in our homes and in our church and in our personal living. Let us forget the interests of self as we enter into the larger interests of the kingdom of God. Very encouraging, uh, upbeat letter. And it uh, uh, sounds like you know, they had a hard start uh, when he first came with illness and whatever else, but the Lord saw them through it. Um, and so things uh, had turned better as the year went, that first year went on. But, uh, well, it's the church, y'all. Uh, and there are always going to be problems in church life. And from the record, it is clear that some, there were problems that would develop. They would be facing other challenges uh, during this time. So, uh, for example, around this time, the session and the deacons, they had to deal with a church treasurer who was charged with, quote, being very negligent in his duties. Uh, in fact, they eventually had to resort to church discipline on him by way of a formal rebuke. Now, that's no fun. Nobody wants to do that. But it was, it was interesting to see how they recorded it in the session minutes. They, put, they wrote this, Mr. So-and-so, name omitted. It's not a name that would mean anything to anyone. Uh, Mr. So-and-so was admonished in a kindly and affectionate manner by the moderator. It's like, that's exactly how church discipline is supposed to be uh, practiced in a kindly and affectionate manner. And worth mentioning that this treasurer did express repentance for whatever his negligence was. I have no idea what exactly he'd done but, uh, or hadn't done. Um, there were some other signs that, yeah, there's some trouble brewing at this uh, time. 
So in 1932, at a meeting of the officers, uh, the minutes uh, record that the pastor had stated that, uh, quote, he had not had the proper support and cooperation of the session in the support of uh, his work. Session, that means the, the group of elders. He also, it also said that the deacons felt that they lacked the, the cooperation of the session in the support of their work. And a few weeks later, uh, a, one of the ruling elders of the church resigned. Maybe that's linked with you know, the, what sounds like some tensions among the leadership. Um, I'll just tell you, I've, I've seen that opera many times. It's a story that it happens in all churches. You go through these periods where you get tensions in the leadership, and by God's grace, things get resolved, reconciled, and so on. It's, but it's a good reminder to pray for the leadership of any congregation. Conyers himself uh, resigned a couple of years later in 1934, and I found this interesting at the congregational meeting they had to vote, are we going to accept his resignation or not? The vote was 18 yes, 17 no. <laughs> they barely let the guy resign. Um, but uh, uh, Conyers, he went on to pastor churches in Ware Shoals, uh, and now I know where that is, having worked at Erskine uh, for many years, and in Fort Mill. Uh, he had a son who went into the ministry, uh, he did come back to preach at Rose Hill some years later, uh, on some occasion in 1942. Um, so, uh, and buried in For Florida, and I like this, his, his gravestone, it just reads, Loving Minister of God. That's nice. Uh, so that was 1934. Uh, the next pastor, early 1935, the church called a widower, Elijah Cullum Grimshaw, as pastor. Boy, they don't name people like they used to either. That's a name. Um, he was born 1874, East Hampton, New York. He had served several congregational churches before transferring into the Presbyterian Church. Uh, one source describes him as a powerful preacher. It's not a great picture of him. It's from the state newspaper. Uh, Deanie kind of got me on the right track to find that. Um, you handed me that those uh, articles. Um, uh, he only wound up serving Rose Hill for about a period of six months and had to resign due to health problems. So there's really not a lot to say about him. Uh, he just was here too short to leave any kind of legacy. However, since he's presumably in glory now, he won't mind me mentioning this one tantalizing story that I came across thanks to the wonders of the internet. Uh, so, September 12th, 1908 edition of The Record, which was a newspaper published in Troy, New York. I just found this, uh, you know, searching information on this guy. It was reported that Elijah Grimshaw and a Jesse Vandenberg were arrested on a charge of attempted pickpocketing. Uh, according to the article, the police had observed this pair engaging in what they viewed as suspicious behavior during Troy's annual Old Home Week celebration, you know, some kind of annual celebration. They were hopping on and off the streetcar like every block or so and maybe seemed to be scoping out the crowd for potential victims. And eventually a jeweler by the name of Frederick Schaefer accused them of attempting to pick his pocket. And so they were taken into custody. Now, Grimshaw, from the start, he insisted that he was an innocent clergyman, and to back up his claim, he produced a copy of a, a gospel tract that he had written by the name of Empty Seats. Uh, and uh, various clergy from Troy and uh, elsewhere, they came out kind of in support of, as character witnesses. They had worked with him before in revival services, evangelistic services, and so on, um, but the police claimed that he was a nationally known criminal who had been profiled in an edition of the magazine, The Detective. I looked and looked to try to find that article. Uh, if somebody else is able to find it, boy, I would, I would love you. Uh, <laughs> and there were some reports that came in from Milwaukee from other clergy claiming that he had done mission work there but that he left under a cloud of suspicion. Um, 
and uh, there was charts, indications of improper conduct and that he had absconded while owing people money and that sort of thing. Uh, Jesse Vandenberg made bail, but Grimshaw couldn't, so he spent a few nights in jail. So there's the question. Was Rose Hill's pastor, the Reverend Dr. Elijah Cullum Grimshaw, a former pickpocket who was a nationally known criminal? Well, the jeweler who made the initial charges, uh, he, he failed to appear in court to press charges, and so Grimshaw was released uh, without any charges being filed. He really did publish a gospel tract, Empty Seats. Uh, clearly, he had a long record of ministry in the churches uh, throughout the country. Maybe he was just trying to scope out people to hand copies of his tract to and to give an evangelistic presentation. Well, we may never know the truth, but uh, our reporters are working on it, and we will update you as this story develops. Well, uh, poor health forced Elijah Grimshaw to uh, resign. That was all 1908, by the way. You know, years later was this time in Rose Hill. Um, uh, the session turned to another uh, theological professor for help. They asked Dr. Busby Allen Reed to supply them as an interim. Uh, he was teaching at a Columbia Bible College. He had served various pastors, but he mostly had more of a teaching ministry. Uh, he uh, was teaching at Columbia Bible College. He, had taught at, he taught at a number of Bible institutes and colleges um, during his career. That was where he spent really more of his time. Um, uh, the uh, church finances were still an issue, <laughs> and so... Uh, Rose Hill's officers were having repeated discussions of, you know, can we pay a full-time pastor's salary? Should we try to call a full-time pastor? People were very happy with Dr. Reed's ministry, um, and so the session kept asking the presbytery to, you know, hey, can you extend this interim relationship that we have? Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, things were going well. People liked uh, Dr. Reed, but uh, eventually the uh, well, at one point, the session called a congregational meeting to ask the, the congregation, what do you think? Are we, uh, the, the officers seem to think, you know, we're ready to call a full-time pastor again. Let's put that uh, question to the congregation. Uh, well, uh, at that congregational meeting, the church decided that, no, oh, no, nah, nah, we good. Uh, <laughs> they were satisfied with the present preaching relation, arrangement and that motion uh, was passed by a great majority vote. But Presbytery was concerned, and so they were kind of pressuring the session, like, you really need to call a pastor, and you need to get things moving here. And so eventually, in 1941, uh, Dr. Reed uh, gave up his letter of resignation. He personally didn't think that Rose Hill was at a place to call a full-time pastor, uh, but the elders, the deacons, they thought otherwise, and so he just wanted to you know, honor that. So he wrote this in his resignation letter. I thought this was good. Uh, my only purpose in continuing a supply pastor during the past five years has been to build up the work in such a way as to enable it to function as a fully developed church. Personally, I do not believe that the church has quite reached the stage where it can support a full-time man. Now, the active membership at that time was about 73 adults. Um, he goes on, for this reason, my first thought was to continue my services for a while longer, especially since the work was progressing so nicely, and the people of the congregation were with me almost 100% cooperating in every possible way. However, since two elders and three deacons feel that the church has reached a point where I can call a full-time minister, I do not wish to interfere in any way with the progress of the church. So, but, I mean, you know, besides that difference of opinion, he says, I've had an unusually happy fellowship with the people. They've cooperated in every way with me, and it has been a real pleasure to serve a congregation so loyal and responsive. So clearly a very warm relationship there. But the church was just, it was getting to that point where they needed to have a permanent full-time pastor again. Well, they didn't quite get one yet. Uh, they got another stated supply, uh, John McEshern, um, and uh, it'll, he, uh, I'll just say, be very brief here, he served a stated supply in 1941 to 43. He had just be, been honorably retired. Uh, he had been a missionary to Korea. There was mention of uh, Korean missions from the Presbyterians. Uh, so he had spent, uh, um, how long, 1912 to 1928, he was a 
uh, a missionary to Korea. And he'd also served various Presbyterian churches. He had served at First Presbyterian Church here in Columbia. And uh, he was retired. He was living in Columbia. So uh, it was made a lot of sense. Here's somebody who's available to help out. And, uh, uh, and so you know, he stepped in to just help things along in the interim. Um, the uh, session did ask the presbytery to form a commission to just help guide things and, again, help lead things during this interim period. And uh, so the commission, this presbytery commission, they met with the session, they met with the church uh, in 1942, January 1942, and it says they asked each member of the session for any information that would help them to get the facts about the church disturbance, which will enable them to help us. And that sounds pretty juicy. Church disturbance, <laughs> rioting in the pews, <laughs> demonstrators outside holding signs, I don't know. We don't know what this disturbance was. Uh, it's another one of those things that has been forgotten by history, and probably that's a good thing. Um, but now we move on uh, to the next one, and uh, this is Alex McFarland Mitchell, um, uh, who claimed that he was born and bred in a briar patch. But specifically, he was born in Thomasville, Georgia in 1898. Uh, Pastor Mitchell broke the mold in more ways than one. Uh, first of all, when he came to Rose Hill, he was a more mature candidate uh, than previous ones. We had all these young pastors typically in the first, uh, you know, first the early years, um, but uh, Pastor Mitchell was much, much older than when, when he started his ministry. Also, you can see from the dates, 1943 to 1972, he stayed a lot longer than anybody else. Um, so, completely different, uh, you know, huge change there. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about him. Some of you know Pastor Mitchell. Uh, most of us don't, but have heard the name. Um, 1918, uh, Mitchell volunteered for military service. Uh, he said, quote, to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, and he worked with the Student Army uh, Corps while he was a student at Davidson College. Uh, he later became a second lieutenant in the Infantry Reserve. He graduated from Davidson College in 1921, and then he taught for a year as a professor of English at Alabama Presbyterian College in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, but the, the professorial life did not suit him. He said one year was three years too much. And by his own admission, he says, I taught English and I murdered it. <laughs> uh, eventually, he felt a call to ministry and wound up uh, studying at Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Um, according to one biographical source, uh, when he was at Davidson College, uh, he had refused to take Greek knowing that it was required for entrance into seminary. And he was thinking that he would close the door on the ministry by not taking Greek. If I don't do this, I'll never have to go into ministry. Um, well, of course, you know how the Lord loves to, anytime you do something like that, he's, he's going to get you. So uh, what that meant was that eventually when he started as a seminary student, he was forced uh, to study Greek and Hebrew at the same time, uh, quote, thus paying the penalty for his sin of omission in omitting Greek in college. But it was worth it. He found that he loved the ministry uh, and preaching much more than teaching English. Um, I found, uh, again, some of you actually knew the man personally, um, and I, uh, Dr. Bumgartner, who preached last night, knew him personally. Uh, I did not. Most folks at Rose Hill uh, nowadays uh, never had the opportunity to meet him. I was able to get a much, much more of a personal uh, picture of him from the material, so uh, uh, if you'll uh, indulge me going a little bit longer, um, uh, you, I get, you get much more of a, a personal picture of him and a little bit of his wife uh, from the material that we have. So, for example, I, this was noted in the session minutes, uh, January 1st, 1945, that Delicious refreshments were served after the meeting by Mrs. Mitchell. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool that that's finding its way into the session records, you know, uh, for later generations to read. 
Um, uh, he was uh, designated as pastor emeritus in 1972, and Dr. Bumgartner actually told the story last night about the tricks he would play uh, golfing. Uh, they, the two of them would golf every Monday, and he mentioned how he would put these weighted golf balls there. Uh, he was able to do that. Uh, pastor Mitchell had poor eyesight because of cataracts. Um, and in fact, uh, you find notes in the session minutes where it's like, we're giving Pastor Mitchell a Sunday off to allow his new glasses to get adjusted. Well, that's nice of them. Um, uh, you, know, you look at the portrait, and it looks like, you know, kind of your classic serious Presbyterian portrait. Um, as I've studied him, uh, I've been really struck with his sense of humor, and a lot of that came out from Dr. Bumgartner last night. Um, uh, give you some samples of it besides the ones that uh, were told last evening. Uh, one church member uh, called him one day because they needed to arrange a speaker for a ladies event, and so he called Pastor Mitchell. And he's like, uh, asked him if he knew any professional women, and he said, "Well, he's never met an amateur one." <laughs> His wife also had a sense of humor. Uh, on another occasion, they. He was looking for a new sign for the church and couldn't find what he wanted here locally. So he drove up to Charlotte. He got there. He realized he'd forgotten the dimensions of the sign, and he'd forgotten the Bible verse that they were going to put on the sign. So he sends a message to his wife and gets like a telegram in reply that probably shocked the operator. For unto us a child is born four feet wide and six feet long. (laughs) That's a big baby. <laughs> uh, and then there was the day he got a call from his Georgia hometown looking for donations to, to fund building a fence around the local cemetery. And his response was, in the cemetery, the people who are in there, they can't get out. And those who are out don't want to get in. So why do you need a fence? <laughs> um, uh, just to, you know, so much that could be said, uh, his, his pastorate brought great stability to the church financially, spiritually, pastorally. Uh, that's, that's some of the blessing of such a long-term pastor of 29 years. Um, he had a very shepherd's heart as well, uh, a newspaper article uh, at his retirement called him a dean of pastors. And one colleague uh, said this, I've seen Alex visiting in the hospitals more than any other minister in all of Columbia. Uh, And uh, Dr. Mumgartner just told me this uh, the other day or two ago, that uh, after a funeral, Pastor Mitchell would typically stay in bed for a couple of days because he just took it so hard when he lost one of his congregants. Um, That says a lot. He loved to shepherd uh, the children of the church as well, and even really the whole neighborhood. There was a businessman who lived uh, here in the neighborhood who once said, well, I don't go to church, but I send my children to Rose Hill because of the Mitchells. And uh, he said, uh, uh, Mitchell said that when he parked his car in the middle of the street to go visit someone, and he heard a child at the end of the street call out, hi, Mr. Mitch, he said he would rather hear that than be president. So... Uh, He attempted to resign multiple times, starting in 1968. The denomination required, uh, uh, officially they required a pastor to retire at age 70. Um, The congregation unanimously voted to reject his resignation, and they appealed to Presbytery to grant an extension of service. So they asked for extensions in 1968, and 1969, and 1970, and for the last time in 1971, and finally that year, they also voted to establish a pulpit committee to call his successor, to look for his successor. Um, and um, uh, some things I could say about his, the whole uh, retirement, uh, it, was, it was a big deal. Uh, it was actually the first retirement service that the Presbytery ever held. They, they kind of created a new thing for Pastor Mitchell because his retirement 
was such a significant thing. He had been actually a major leader in uh, the presbytery. He was the stated clerk of the presbytery, which is an important role. Um, like his predecessors, he did not leave behind many published writings. Uh, it's hard even to find sermon manuscripts. I mean, maybe some relative has you know, his sermon manuscripts in a box in their attic. Again, if you have them, send them my way. <laughs> Um, I've been able to find a few things that he wrote or a few things that he said that were recorded, uh, written down. Uh, he said this about the challenge of reading the Bible. We heard about uh, kind of the, the issue of Scripture in uh, Pastor Wilk's presentation. This is what uh, Pastor Mitchell said. Uh, if we had been asked to write Scripture, we probably would have written it quite differently. If we're honest with ourselves, most of us would admit that there are a number of teaching, teachings in Scripture which we do not like. Its teaching does not agree with our concept of how we would run a world or even make a world. That brings up a question which needs careful consideration. Did God ask you what he should do or what he would require of his creations? The temptation to try to force God to accept our position is strong in all of us. Do we try to make God think our thoughts or do we try to think God's thoughts? Which is more important, my idea of revelation or God's revelation of his instructions to mankind. Uh, another place he says this, uh, building on the foundation of Scripture, uh, he was always pointing people to the work of Christ. And one of the few sermons that I've been able to find, he says this, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory, the eternal victory, the victory which lifts our spirits, which changes us from condemned sinners into saints with a living God. Thanks be to God, thanks be to God who has done that for us, even at the price of his own beloved son on Calvary's cross. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory and to our Lord Jesus Christ. I think 29 years of preaching the Bible and pointing people to Christ like that had a, a, just a tremendous impact on this congregation. Even though most of us uh, have never heard him or met him, it's clear that the Lord used Pastor Mitchell in a special way to build Rose Hill up uh, for those years. And that's where I almost end my story. <laughs> uh, just very quickly mention the rest of the register of pastors of Rose Hill. Uh, sorry, the print is kind of small, um, but uh, this gives us a quick summary of things. Um, so 1972 to 1977, uh, the Reverend Ken Kepler Jr. was the pastor. 1978 to 82 was Dr. John Baumgartner, who uh, we met, uh, some of you may have met last night or heard. Um, and uh, I have one note there. It was during his time, really at the end conclusion of it, that we had the big church turnaround. And that's, a again, a little plug for my sanctuary thing. But it used to be that the church went the other direction. So the pulpit was over there. This was the back of the congregation. I'll talk about that more tomorrow, or I can talk about it during the break if you like. Uh, but that was a, that was a big thing. Um, then Craig Wilkes uh, from 1983 to 1993, and in 83 was the Great Secession. That's when Rose Hill joined the Presbyterian Church in America. So that was a huge event uh, historically. Uh, 1994 to 2005 was the Re Reverend Gary Bainton. And one thing I'll mention about that time was that in 1997, uh, Rose Hill uh, went through a merger with another local church in town, Southeast PCA, and really uh, quite a, num a number of our members, that's, that's sort of their background. I think that's where the Williams were from. Um, and so that was just an important part of, that's an important part of our DNA. Uh, in 2005 and 6, uh, for about a, I think, not eight, nine months period, uh, the Reverend Dr. John Harvey was a supply pastor. He's a professor out at uh, CIU, great fellow. We love to have him back here. He's very engaging. And so uh, he just helped kind of fill the gap. But again, another theology professor helping out around here. Um, the Reverend Drew Kornreich was 2006 to 2012, and uh, Drew was one of my best friends at seminary, actually. So it's a small world, providentially, the Lord brought us together here in Columbia. 
And then, well, I started here in 2012. And <laughs> jury's still out on that one. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, there's so much more that could be said talking about seminary students that the church has you know, helped into ministry, pastors who've come out of this church, missionaries, RUF workers, Reformed University Fellowship workers, uh, church planters that have been sent out. Uh, Rose Hill has a very strong record of uh, denominational support. Um, in going through all these old pictures of the church, I keep coming across, you know, hey, here are all my old seminary professors. They all preached here. And um, uh, Josh McDowell preached here. I'd seen that in the minutes, and Dr. Bumgartner mentioned that. And, uh, you know, Henry Alexander White, oh, well, I mentioned him earlier. Um, uh, there's really, there's so much more that could be said, but kind of like the book of Hebrews chapter 11 says, time would fail me to tell uh, all that could be said. So just by way of wrapping up, uh, I want to go back to the quote that was made by the Presbytery about the Rose Hill Mission. Rose Hill is located in a mill, vi mill village which the light is transforming. Um, and I... My prayer is that that would continue to be true as we enter our second century of life and hopefully for many, many, many years to come. Let me pray. Uh, I will pray uh, just about our morning's uh, uh, talks, but I'll also ask the blessing for the meal and then um, we, we can uh, head on out to enjoy some cookout. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your work here uh, for the past century, and Lord, even before that, uh, you were uh, working in the lives of many believers, and thank you for what we've heard this morning from Pastor Wilkes and from this presentation. Thank you for the ways that you have been uh, guiding Rose Hill, uh, sustaining her through hard times and blessing her uh, in times of plenty. Lord, uh, whether in uh, hard times or good times, uh, you are our good God and Savior, and we give you the praise. We pray that you bless uh, the meal we're about to enjoy. We pray again for a good time of fellowship that we might be able to um, just deepen our uh, friendships uh, and make new friendships, and that you would strengthen us together as the body of Christ. Bless the food and bless those who've worked to uh, prepare it. We ask all of this now in Jesus' name.